Krishna consciousness. So it's, it's very important for us that we have to hear it regularly, to remind ourselves, to refresh ourselves. So in Bhagavad Gita we see how in the first six chapters Lord Krishna, well, we had Arjuna surrendering to Lord Krishna and asking Lord Krishna to become his teacher. Right? It was mentioned, Shikshasteham sadimam tvam prapanam. Arjuna said to Krishna, Now I am your disciple and a soul surrendered unto you. Please instruct me. So Lord Krishna began instructing Arjuna about his foolishness. Actually, Lord Krishna immediately took the position of the teacher and he began by chastising Arjuna and telling him that you are speaking learned words but you are mourning for what is not worthy of grief. Arjuna had been speaking about compassion and he was worried about sinful reactions and he said, I won't be able to enjoy the kingdom. Different reasons Arjuna had about why he didn't want to take part in the battle. But Arjuna was intelligent that he placed his problems in front of his teacher so the teacher, Lord Sri Krishna, could help him and guide him. And then after Arjuna had given his reasons why he didn't want to fight and then he came to Krishna and asked Lord Krishna to instruct him, then Krishna, Lord, Lord Sri Krishna, pointed out to Arjuna that all of the reasons which he had for not wanting to fight were wrong. And Lord, Lord Sri Krishna said to Arjuna that your compassion is based on the body. You should be compassionate on the soul, not on the body. The body is only like the dress. And just as we change the dress, we change also the bodies. So there's no justification for lamenting about the body. In this way, Lord Krishna was telling Arjuna that you were worried about fighting, but you have to understand people are going to die anyway, whether you fight in the war or not. Everyone is going to meet their death sooner or later. Lord Sri Krishna then went on to explain to Arjuna that you don't have to worry about sinful reactions. If you do your duty as karma yoga, then there is no reaction. Karma yoga means working in a detached manner. It's not just simply working, but it's working without being attached to the results. So this requires some purification. We have to be willing to let go, not to be attached. Of course, we're here in the material world and we're very attached. We're attached to our cars, for example, right? If somebody hits your car, who hit me? Who damaged my car? Like well, you would certainly, and that's, that's, we could say that's natural. And so we, we do have attachments. We are concerned about our property. We're concerned about our own health. And we want to keep ourselves uh, safe from the different diseases which are going around all the time. So we do have to be pregnant.
practical in living in this world. At the same time, we have to understand the inevitability of death. The end of life will come for all of us. Srila Prabhupada used to quote a common saying. He would say, as sure as death, and death is sure. Of course, when it's going to come, we don't know. But we should be ready. And Bhagavad Gita is preparing all of us for that moment. The eighth chapter, which you're going to begin after this class tonight, I think next week you will go on to the eighth chapter, is called Attaining the Supreme. We want to come to the Supreme. We want to go back to Godhead, back to our eternal home, our abode in the Kingdom of God. But to go there, we have to be qualified. And the qualification is, we have to let go of this place. If we are holding on to this place and we still keep desires for this world, we won't be able to go there. Not only do we have to let go, but we have to develop a desire to want to go there. Just like People see, you know, you go to, you see sometimes travel agents and they will have pictures of, well, Malaysian people, where do they like to go? You know, they like to go to sometimes London and Melbourne and Sydney and sometimes even further away, like to the US is like that. And so, People become fascinated by the thought of going to these places. I remember that there was one young student I knew and they were preparing to take the examination to get the scholarship to go to an overseas university, either in the UK or the USA. So they prepared themselves by memorizing every word in the English dictionary. <laughs> you know, I was astonished, you know, that, oh my goodness, I, I don't know these words, you know, you know so many words. That was because they were so eager, they had such a strong desire that, no, I want to go there, I want to get this scholarship, I want to go there. And so they made great endeavors to, to that extent that they memorized all of the words there in the dictionary. So similarly, we also have to prepare ourselves that at the end of this life, we will be ready to go there, to go to be with Lord Sri Krishna. And we do have some nice examples about devotees who gave up this world and went back to Godhead. There's a famous devotee in Maharashtra, uh, Tukaram. There's a wonderful movie about Tukaram. I don't know if you ever saw it, but it's a very nice classical new movie showing Tukaram and the difficulties, all the troubles he had, different people criticizing him and complaining about him. And, you know, wife also sometimes also complaining, you know, because he's, he's singing songs glorifying Lord Sri Krishna constantly. And his wife was saying, why don't you go to work? Why don't you bring money? You know, like this. And so it finally happened that it came time for Tukaram to go back to Godhead. And the airplane came from the spiritual world. And that place is marked, it's there, in Maharashtra, there's a place where the airplane came 
and took her arm. He got in the airplane and he told his wife, come, come on, let's go. I said, no, no, I'm not going. So she didn't go. But he went. He went back to God. So took her arm. The, you know, the airplane came and he understood. Time for me to go. And similarly, Dhruva Maharaj. Dhruva Maharaj is, of course, very famous that when he was a young boy, he'd gone to the forest and he'd done austerities there for six months. And he had material desires, you know. Sometimes people think that, oh, because I have material desires, I can't be a devotee. No, that's not true. Even if you do have material desires, you can still be a devotee. And by being a devotee, we will benefit ourselves and we will gradually purify ourselves of these material desires. So Dhruva Maharaj had a great material desire. He wanted a kingdom. He wanted a kingdom greater than his great-grandfather. Dhruva Maharaj was born, he was the son of Uttanapad. Uttanapad was the son of Manu, Swayambhu Manu. In one day of Brahma, there are 14 Manus. So the first Manu in this day of Brahma was Swayambhu. Swambhuva Manu and he was the father of Uttanapad. There were two sons actually, Uttanapad and Priyabrat. And they also had, his, he and his wife, they had also three daughters. One of the daughters was Devahuti, who is very well known because she went on to become the mother of, of Kapila, Lord Kapila who spoke the Sankhya philosophy. Anyway, Swayambhuva Manu was the father of Uttanapad. Uttanapad was the father of Dhruva. And Swayambhuva Manu was one of the sons of Brahma. Chaturmuk Brahma. Our Brahma is Chaturmuk Brahma. It's a small Brahma. Other universes are much bigger. In other universes, Brahma has many heads. But in our universe, because our universe is not so big, he does the small Brahma with four heads. So Dhruva Maharaj, as a young boy, he had this royal blood, the mood, the Kshatriya mood. And when he got insulted by his stepmother, he was so agitated and so disturbed that he thought, I have to get a kingdom greater than even my grandfather. And so his, his mother suggested to him that you want to find God because she told him, oh, she said, I can't help you. She said, you should go to God. Ask God to help you. So he said, where will I find God? So she said to him, well, many great sages say go to the forest to find God. So Dhruva said, then I will go there. And he went there and he did his austerities with the help of Narada Muni, his instructions. Narada gave him some advice, taught him what to do, where to go. And so Dhruva did everything he was told and in six Six months only, he was able to meet with the Lord. The Supreme Personality of Godhead came there on the bank of Garuda and fulfilled the desire of Dhruva Maharaj. So that was when he was a young boy. And because Dhruva Maharaj wanted a kingdom, when the Lord came there, he told them, you're going to become the king. He said, not only that, he said, you're going to rule the, the kingdom for, I think it was 26,000 years or more. You know, a very long time. Satya Yuga. Satya Yuga people live 
100,000 years. One lakh. It's a long life, isn't it? One lakh. Would you like to live that long? No, I don't blame you, right? Yeah. Not something to look forward to, is it? Even when you get to 50 and 60, it's terrible. <laughs> what to speak of <laughs> hundreds and thousands of years. So, uh, Dhruva Maharaj was told, you're going to become the king, and you'll rule the world for thousands of years, and then after that, then you're going to go to the pole star, and you will reside there. The pole star is sometimes called Dhruva Loka. It's the one star which you see in the sky, it stays in the same place. It never moves. And all of the other planets and all the other stars, they're all rotating around the pole star. So Dhruva Maharaj resides there on the pole star. But what happened was, he ruled the world for thousands of years, and then it came time for him to retire. So, he went to Badarik Ashram. Do you know Badarik Ashram? Maybe you can go to Chardam sometime. In Himalayas, there is Chardam. Gangotri, Yamunotri, Badarik Ashram, and Kedarnath Ashram. Kitana, Badrina, Gangotri, Yamanotri. This they say Chardam Yatra in the Himalayas. You like cold? You can go there. Most of the year snow. And rain. And you know, not going to be hot. You have to be take some warm clothes. <laughs> Warm there. So Dhruva Maharaj went there to Badarik Ashram and he was staying there because the Vedic culture divides life from student life, which is like Brahmachari or Brahmachari before marriage, right? The student life and then married life, Grihastha life, and then after Grihastha life, then retired life, what we would call vanaprastha, the retired life. And after retired life, then there comes renounced life. So Dhruva Maharaj was uh, in family life. After growing up a bit, he was married and he had his family. He ruled the world for thousands of years. And then came time for him to retire. So he went to Badarik Ashram, up in the Himalayas. Huh. Nara Narayan Rishis reside there, eternally, doing austerities. So Dhruva Maharaj also went there and stayed there. And then it happened, while he was staying there, one day, the airplane came from Vaikuntha. The airplane came. And uh, they told him, we'll come to take you to your next place. So Dhruva Maharaj went and he offered obeisances to the people there. He took their blessings. Then he circumambulated the airplane. And then he got into the airplane. But then he remembered, oh, just a minute. <laughs> what about my mother? It was not material affection, but his mother was actually like his guide, his spiritual guide, because it was his mother who had told him, you should go to find God. And he remembered his mother before he left to go to the spiritual world. He thought, oh, what about my mother? But the man in Vaikot, from Vaikuntha who came in the airplane to Take Dhruva Maharaj. They said, don't worry, look, over there, there was another airplane. And he saw his mother was getting into the airplane. And she was also going to go back 
to the spiritual world. So in this way, Dhruva Maharaj went back to Godhead. And he's there. The pole star, Dhruva Loka, is actually a spiritual planet which is within this universe. It's never annihilated. Although the other planets in this universe are all annihilated, the pole star is never annihilated. So Dhruva Maharaj resides there. So he's a nice example of how to leave the world. But there's another one also I wanted to mention to you. This is about Maharaj Kadvanga. Gadvanga. Maharaj Gadvanga was a, a Kshatriya, like Arjuna, he was a Kshatriya and he was given a job, he was taken by the demigods to go to the heavenly planets, just like Arjuna sometimes would also go to the heavenly planets. We, we, we can't really go to heavenly planets, right? Difficult, but but you can go by pious activities. If you do a lot of pious activities, a lot of punya karma, then next life you can go to heavenly planet, if, if that's what you want. There's a, a lot of opulence there. You like opulence and uh, everyone's very intelligent and good looking and there's no COVID, there's no viruses there or anything. You know, you can relax a little there and enjoy, but you can't stay there forever because the heavenly planets are still in the material realm. You can go there for some time and you have to leave. You have to come back when we need, just like you can go to America so long as you have some money. But when the money is finished, then you think I better go back to Malaysia. I better come back and go back to work again, you know. Jai. Radha Krishna ki jai. Gurmi jai ki jai. So the heavenly planets is like that. You have accumulated some piety, you can go there, you can stay there, but not forever. You have to come back. Yeah. So, Maharaj Garbanga, he was taken by the demigods. They wanted him to go there to fight because he was a great fighter. This was before the time of Arjuna, long before in another age. So Garbhanga Maharaj went to the heavenly planets and he fought there on behalf of the demigods against the demons. You know, there's always the conflict. The Asuras and the Daivas, they're always fighting each other. The, de de the Devas reside in the heavenly planets and the Asuras, they're in the lower planets. They're in the lower region of the universe where they have their own planet system and people like Bali Maharaj and Prahlad Maharaj they live there they reside there in this region in the lower region of the universe it's opulent very opulent but it's also there's no light there's no sunlight. Could you imagine Malaysia without sunlight? No? It would be very difficult, wouldn't it? If it was always dark and cold and there was no light. So the lower region of the universe is like that. There's no sunlight. It's the lower region of the universe. It's below Bumandala. Our earth planet is in Bumandala, but below Bumandala you have the sub subterranean heavenly planets. And it's dark. To, to light the place, all the demons, they have jewels on their head. And the jewel, the 
light from the jewels provide the light for the people. So the, there's always some conflict. The demons sometimes they come and they try to conquer the heavenly planets. They come there and they try to conquer the demigods just like Bali Maharaj led the demi demigods, uh, led the demons, they defeated the demigods, and Indra and the other demigods, they had to go and hide. So the demigods and the demons are always fighting. The demigods, they always are obedient to the laws of God. But the demons, they, they don't care for the authority of the Supreme Lord. They are disobedient. They won't follow the laws of God. Then this is why they live in the lower region of the universe. And this is why the Lord will come. He will help the demigods. When the demigods are fighting the demons, Lord Krishna will come and help the demigods so that they can defeat the demons. Because demigods are the bodhis. They will follow the instructions. They will do what Krishna tells them. So Gadvanga was taken from the earth to, so up to heavenly planets to go and help there against the demons. And he fought for a long time. And the demigods were very happy. But then after some time, then Kartikeya came. Now Kartikeya is very popular here in Malaysia, right? They're coming up to time, Pusam. Kartikeya means Murga, right? Lord Murga. So you're all ready to do your Thai Pusam and carry your milk and bathe Lord Murga. Lord Murga, among generals I am Murga, Lord Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita. So he's a great general, great fighter. So demigods told Kadvanga, we don't need you anymore. Lord Murga is here. He will be in charge now. So they said, anyway, you've done very good. We're very grateful to you. We'll give you blessing. Whatever benediction you like, you ask us. You know, we what people often worship devas here, right? Do you go to temples and worship the devas, right? Give me wealth, give me husband, give me money, give me long life. These problems, you know, often people go to the different temples and they they have a request. They're asking the different desire. So the demigods told Kanvanga, we can give you whatever you want. So he said, just tell me one thing. He said, I just want one thing from you. Just tell me, how long do I have left to live in this world? Oh, would you like to know that? <laughs> would you? <laughs> anyway, Kadvanga said, just tell me, how long am I going to be here in this the demigod said, oh, they said, you only have a moment's time left. You don't have a long time left. The, the, your time is almost finished. Your, your life is almost at an end. So Gadvanga heard this and immediately he left the heavenly planets and he came back to this planet. He came back here to this planet and he sat and he fixed his mind on the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord. And in this way he could give up his life and he could go back to God. He got success. Now, we, you know, if we were told you have a moment's left, what would we do? Oh, oh, oh. You know, we will panic. <laughs> we'll think, wait. What about my my children? What about my my business? What about my bank balance? And oh, so many things we want to worry about and think about. But Gadvanga Maharaj, he had prepared 
himself to give up everything. And so when the time came, he could immediately go back home, back to God. And we see the same example with Maharaj Parikshit, the grandson of Arjuna, that he was cursed to die seven days. A bit longer than Kapvanga, right? Kapvanga had only a moment. But Parikshit Maharaj, he was given seven days. So what did he do to prepare himself? He gave up everything. He left the kingdom and his royal home and the family and everything. He put on simple dress and he went to find the company of saintly persons who could instruct him and guide him in preparing for leaving this world. Very important to get the right association at the time, especially at the time when we're preparing to leave this world. So one of the services which the devotees which we often do is that when one of our devotees is at the point of leaving the body, at the point of leaving this mortal frame, then we would like to go there and chant for them, particularly chanting the holy name, the Maha Mantra, and maybe even also reading if time and circumstances permit, we will also read to them. I remember I was in Vrindavan, this was many years ago, there was a lady, she was actually from South Africa. So she had been diagnosed with terminal cancer and she had come to Vrindavan and she had her she had an apartment there in Vrindavan and she came there to prepare herself for leaving the body. And she did it very nicely under the guidance of the devotees. The devotees would come chant for her and they would discuss topics of Lord Krishna and they, and they encourage this lady to focus her mind on what position she was aspiring for in the spiritual world. She was actually a very talented artist and she, she was focusing, she said, I want to go to this, when I go to the spiritual world, I would like to be able to decorate the Srimati Radharani. She wanted to do that, she thought that would be a nice service. Just like, you know, women they put on makeup and so on, particularly, you know, when they have functions like marriage and so on, they decorate themselves very lavishly. So this lady was thinking that if I'm going to leave the body, let me go to the spiritual world and let me be a servant, one of the servants of the gopis and I can decorate Srimati Radharani for the pleasure of Lord Krishna. And in this, this was her meditation as she was leaving the world. And so we have to understand how to prepare ourselves for this moment, which is sometimes we say the final exam. You know, just like if you're studying and you, you, you may study for several years, and then you have the final exam. The finals come, you know. And you want to you want to pass, you want to do well in the, the final exam. So uh, our final examination comes at the end of life. Of course, we give up one body, you get another chance, even if we fail, we'll get another chance. But if you fail, it means you have to come back again, just like if 
you fail the exam, you have to maybe take the course again, then you have to then the examination again until you pass. So similarly, with the human life, our test is coming at the end of life that we want to be able to fix our mind on the Supreme Lord. We want to go to His abode. And to fully absorb ourselves in thinking of Him requires giving up the material things. So we have to let go of the material in order to fully hold on to the spiritual. You cannot have your feet in two boats. Right? If there's two boats in it, you put one foot in one boat, one foot in another boat, you get problems. We're holding on to the material, at the same time we're trying to take the spiritual, it won't work. We have to be willing to let go. And the process of letting go is made very easy for us, very natural that without any great effort we can let go of the material by simply absorbing ourselves in hearing and chanting about Krishna. The more we hear and chant and in the association of devotees, then we don't even think about it. We don't even think about the material, let, letting go, because we've, we've already so absorbed in our hearing and our chanting. We don't worry about the other things. We're not so anxious about it because we're so absorbed in hearing and chanting the glories of Lord Sri Krishna. So, of course, this, this is being described to us in this uh, middle section of the Bhagavad Gita chapter 7 to chapter 12, describing Bhakti Yoga. At the end of the sixth chapter, Lord Krishna had said, of all yogis, the topmost yogi is the one who is always thinking of me and engaged in my devotional service. And then in the seventh chapter, Lord Krishna began the seventh chapter by telling Arjuna, now hear, O Arjuna. And we have to understand, hearing is the beginning of Bhakti Yoga. This is how we begin to practice Bhakti Yoga. We come and we hear, and we hear again and again, and the more we hear, the more we start to become absorbed in thinking of Krishna. It comes naturally. We didn't we didn't have to go through any agony, oh I don't I don't want to give up, oh I don't want to let go. We just simply have to hear about Krishna and naturally the other things they'll just they'll just become insignificant because as we hear more and more we will realize what is actually dear to us is Lord Krishna and the other things are all very temporary anyway they don't last forever so Krishna consciousness is a very practical science it's a process by which we can all come to a higher level of consciousness. So it begins by hearing. Lord Krishna said, now hear, Arjuna, how by practicing yoga in full consciousness of me, you can know me in full, free from doubt. Doubts. Remember, Arjuna had addressed Krishna as Madhusudana. That Arjuna said to Krishna that you killed the demon Madhu. So he said, his doubts are like demons. Doubt.
doubt, we, our, I doubt, I doubt, sometimes we doubt, is there really another life? Because sometimes people are very materialistic and we're thinking, well, you know, material body is good and I'm enjoying the material body. I don't want to give it up. But, is there any example of anyone who didn't give up the body? Everyone has to give up. Even people became very powerful and had big empires, they all had to give up their bodies. So, we have to understand the nature of the material world, that it is temporary. The Lord Krishna is describing the nature of the material world. In the seventh chapter, he described the elements of the material world. He described the prakriti. Bhumer apo nalo bayu kammano buddhir evacha ahankara itiyamme vina prakritir ashtada earth water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and false ego. All together, these eight comprise my separated material elements. So this is the material elements. There are five gross elements, earth, water, fire, air, and ether. Our bodies are made up of these things. Within our body, there's earth and water and fire and air and ether. The Ayurvedic system of medicine treats, if there's some imbalance of these things, then we get sick. Just like fire is important to have digestion, and air is also important. You don't just want to have a lot of water and no air. Huh? So when we eat, we have to understand, don't eat too much, but don't eat too little. Hmm? They say, sometimes they say one third water, one third food, and one third empty. Keeps. Right? Don't just fill the belly with food. You have to have some water and you need also some air. Yeah. So these things are there in the body. But then there's also the subtle elements. The mind, the intelligence and the ego. Hmm? These are subtle. Like we cannot say, oh this is the mind. They may do operation, you can't find the mind. You're not going to find, where's the intelligence? It's, it's subtle. People have intelligence, people have a mind. But, where is it? Can you see it? No, you cannot see it. It's subtle. So, Lord Krishna creates these things. This is Krishna's energy, Krishna's prakriti. Lord Krishna creates the mind and he creates the intelligence and the ego as well as all of the different elements. And then Lord Krishna says that besides these, there's another energy of mind which are all living entities. Aparyam mitasthvanyam prakritim Vidime para Jiva Bhuta Mahabaho Yeidam Dariyatejagat. Lord Krishna said there's another energy of mine which are all living entities, Prakriti. We are also Prakriti, but we are different from the, the gross elements, this material element, this word. This metal, this microphone, this is a gross element. But there's the living entities. 
living entities are also prakriti, meaning Krishna's energy. But we are superior prakriti. We are different from the table. We have consciousness. There is no consciousness in the table. There is no consciousness in the building. But consciousness is there in the living entities, even in the, the trees and the plants and the flowers, the birds and the animals, they all have consciousness. Just like sometimes they're taking the animals to the slaughterhouse, sometimes we see the unfortunate animals being led into the slaughterhouse and sometimes the animals will try to escape because they can understand what is happening. And sometimes some different animals, they get away, they escape. There's examples of cows, how they jumped over huge walls to escape. So, the trees also have consciousness, but the consciousness is restricted because of the body. But they do have consciousness. It's just of a different level. It's not like the human consciousness or even the animal consciousness because it's very covered, very restricted consciousness. But in the past, scientists have done research. For example, there was one scientist, he played different kinds of music to different plants. And he would play sometimes music which was very pleasing and gentle and very, give you a good, and the flowers and the plants would all bloom nicely and become very, and other times you play music which was very harsh and nasty and, and, the, and the plants would dry up, they would just shrivel. They were so conscious of the sound. So the plants also have consciousness, just as animals have consciousness and people also have consciousness. There is consciousness, and that consciousness, that is the symptom of life, and that is the symptom of the soul, that there are souls in all different living entities. And Lord Krishna said, they're all his prakriti. But the problem is, jaya dam jaryate jagat. We are trying to exploit that nature for ourselves. We are not thinking that it's Krishna's energy. We are thinking it's for me, it's for my enjoyment. We take it for our own self. So that's the difference, that's the problem. So then Lord Krishna then goes on to describe about how rare, well, uh, he's, he's a, the, the, the rare that people take an interest in self-realization. Out of thousands among men, hardly one is endeavoring for perfection. And of those who have achieved perfection, hardly one knows me in truth. So, devotional service is rare. It's not that everyone is able to immediately take up devotional service. Ordinary people are just busy with their eating and sleeping. They don't think about anything higher. Their consciousness is restricted to just material life. So that's for most people, but there are people who have higher interests. And Lord Krishna explains, there are four kinds of people who don't surrender to Him. 
And then he explains four kinds of people who do surrender. There are different kinds of people who don't surrender. He mentions, he said, they're all duskritina. Duskritina means they're not pious people. They're not pious. They're very materialistic, very attached. And we find people like that. One class is called mudha. Mudha means like donkeys. Like donkeys. The, the example of the donkey is given because the donkey will work very hard just to eat some grass. But grass is growing everywhere. The donkey doesn't need to carry, doesn't need to work hard. If he just wants some grass, it's there, it can just go and eat. But the donkey thinks, if I don't work, I won't get my grass to eat. So people are thinking like that. They're also working hard just for some grass. They work big factories, they work long hours every day working. Why? Just to eat and then sleep. So that is mudha. Another class of people who don't surrender were Nara Dharma. Nara means people, humans, and Adama means lowest of people. The lowest of people are people who are born in good families, maybe like Brahminical families, but who simply give up all their spiritual culture and just pursue the path of gross materialism. They're called Nara Dhamma. They have the ability, they have the birth, they have the intelligence, they have the everything which was, is there to help them for spiritual life. But they say, oh no, no, I know that. Just, just let me enjoy, just let me drink alcohol, let me eat everything, let me smoke and drink and enjoy, gamble. And, but they don't think about any kind of spiritual culture. Although they could, they, very easily they could do it, but they don't do it. So these people are described Nara Dhamma, the lowest of men. And then there's another class of people, uh, Maya Amparita Gyan. One whose knowledge is stolen by illusion. In other words, they may read scriptures like Bhagavad Gita, but they will not take the authorized version. They will not hear the words of the Acharyas. They will not hear the pure devotees. They will simply interpret the scriptures on their own, by their own ideas. And then the fourth kind of people who don't surrender to Krishna are called Asuram Bhavam Ashrita. People who are atheistic and blasphemers. They will never surrender to Krishna. So there are four categories of people who never surrender. But then Lord Krishna said there are four categories, there are four categories of people who do surrender. And he mentioned that they are all Sukriti. They have some Punya Karma, very special Punya Karma, that somehow they did some service for a devotee. Somehow they got the blessing, they got the opportunity to associate with devotees. And that was their Punya Karma. And with that kind of Punya, they were able to come to take up devotional service, even though they had material desires. One of the desires was, first of all, distress. 
And Srila Prabhupada said, that is the most common reason for people coming to Krishna consciousness. That people are in distress. We see all over the world, people do things like suicide. They're, people are in so much distress. They're suffering so much. They're so unhappy. They cannot trust anyone. They're very lonely. And they take shelter, sometimes alcohol or whatever. And so people in distress, if they have that Sukriti, if they've done some Sukriti, some good deeds in the association of devotee, they will come to Krishna consciousness. So people in distress, and then people who have material needs. We gave the example, we were talking earlier about Dhruva Maharaj. He wanted a kingdom, so people have material desires, they can also come. Sometimes we get some young men, they have no job. We met this one young man, he had a row with his girlfriend. His girlfriend kicked him out, said, go, I don't want you anymore. And so he was, you know, loitering in the street, nowhere to go. And we met him, they said, oh, why don't you come with us, come and chant Hare Krishna. So he came and became a devotee, he was chanting, and we were preaching, he became a Sankirtan devotee, and he was distributing books. And then he met somebody, and somebody said to him, hey, why don't you come and work for me, I'll give you a job. And so he thought, oh, oh okay. <laughs> and he gave up Krishna consciousness, and he went and took a job working for somebody. So initially he became a devotee, but somehow his material desire was just simply material life. He just wanted to have a, a job, he just wanted to make some money, and so Krishna gave him a job, and <laughs> he gave up Krishna consciousness. And other times you get people who are uh, simply curious, curiosity. They want to know so many things. They want to understand what is this, why you do this. I want to understand more. We have the one man, he was coming, he was coming very regular. And he always had so many nice questions, you know. He, we thought, wow, he's really an intelligent, he's thinking a lot. Then after some time he didn't come anymore. And we wondered what happened to him. And then one of the devotees met him in the street and they said, Hey, what happened to you? You're not coming anymore. He said, Yeah, no more questions. <laughs> so, like that, sometimes, you know, people have questions. And, but the goal of all these questions is to come to the platform of knowledge. And that is the, the, the fourth reason why people come to devotional service in search of knowledge. And Lord Krishna explains that of the four reasons why people come, that is the most important and the best reason. So although we may come in the beginning with other reasons, in distress, or in search of wealth, or curiosity, but the best thing is that we come to the position of knowledge and we go on from there to understand Krishna Consciousness. However, Lord Krishna does say that this path of knowledge will take some time. It, in fact, it says, many lives. Bahunam Jamanamante Gyanavam Mam Prabhati After many births and deaths, one who is actually in knowledge will surrender to Krishna. Such a soul, very rare. And so, if you're going to go to the path of knowledge, take a long time. So we don't go to the path of knowledge, we go to the path of devotion. Because simply by devotion, we can come to Krishna immediately, very quickly and get all success in life, both material and spiritual. Everything can be achieved 
by the process of devotion. So Lord Krishna then also said, this material nature is very difficult to overcome. The famous verse, which is in the seventh chapter, Devi Eheshe Gunamai Mama Maya Duratyaya. Krishna said, Mama Maya, my Maya, Krishna's Maya, and it is Duratyaya. Just chant the holy name, chant and hear about Krishna, take prasada. In this way, we are surrendering to Krishna and we will please Krishna and one day Krishna will come or the men will get in. Are you ready to go back home, back to Godhead? Yes. You say, oh no, I want to stay in claim. Oh, I'm, I'm happy in claim. We have our center here. If I go, who will be in the center? Like, oh, go to Krishna. All right, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions? Yes, Prabhu. Well, Guru Mike, it's all yours, Guru. Thank you, buddy. Why well, didn't you send me for uh, what? Because you were accepted devotee. You didn't see the plane come to Prabhupada? <laughs> <laughs> you have to understand that plane is not material plane. It's a spiritual plane. You have to have spiritual vision. You want to talk about the whole body, the mental body, the exotic body, just not good, 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 Well, Lord Krishna has his prize for everyone. Like Lord Krishna himself, he left the body. He didn't leave his own body, but he left the body to trick everyone. So those people who don't have faith, they think, oh, look, he left, look, he died, he left his body, and like, you know. So we have to understand what actually happened. Do you have any doubts that Prabhupada didn't go back to God then? <laughs> no, you have to have faith. Certainly Prabhupada went back to God then. He showed us how to leave the body. Hearing the holy name in the holy land of Vrindavan with all the devotees. Krishna arranged everything that he could go back to Vrindavan. He could be there in Vrindavan. Thank you. Any other question? They're just like some people, they think Lord Krishna died, you know, they think, oh, the, 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 the hunter hit him in the foot with the arrow. That was Lord Krishna's trick for people who don't have faith. Lord Krishna fooled them. He, yeah, oh yes, I'm dead, look, <laughs> you left a body. But that wasn't his, because Lord Krishna doesn't have a material body. He has a spiritual body. Lord Krishna fought so many demons and so many arrows hit Krishna. And he never died. It wasn't time for him to finish his pastimes. But Lord Krishna took that opportunity to finish his pastimes there. And when, that, when the hunter fired that arrow, Lord Krishna put another, a maya body, an, an, an illusory form of Krishna there. And so materialistic people, they thought, oh, Krishna is dead. Do you think Krishna dies? No. 
He doesn't go grow old. Why will he die? Guru Maharaj, Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Um, we understand that death can happen at any time, and also the human life is you know, not always safe. And, and we uh, we heard from you, Guru Maharaj, you were saying how one devotee, she went to Vrindavan and then she uh, was able to think of how she wants to meditate. But in our daily lives, so we are so enmeshed in our material activities and we are trying to be Krishna conscious. And, and as, at the same time, death is at any time. So what kind of consciousness, how do we meditate on the Vaswadharma or whatever? Well, everyone is inspired to the service of Krishna in a particular manner. You know, some people are absorbed in serving the, their deity. Other people are absorbed in studying Shastra and philosophy. Other people are very active in Kirtan, like that. So, a, a particular activity is there. Everyone has a taste for how they want to be engaged in Krishna's service. And we have to cultivate that taste so that we can continue in the spiritual world in that similar manner. And these activities, we have a taste for hearing or we have a taste for chanting. As I said, the lady, she had a taste for decorating the deities. So like that, we, somebody may have a taste of you know, cooking for the deities. And so in the spiritual world, you can cook for Krishna. And making garlands, ladies also like to make garlands, or men also can make garlands. And we know that Sudama was making garlands for Krishna, and Krishna came there. And he was able to give flower garlands to Lord Krishna. And Lord Krishna blessed him that in this life he would have no difficulties and at the end of life he would go back to God. And he would continue to make garlands in the spiritual world. And so, somebody else may be a tailor. They're making nice dresses for the deities. Make someone else is making jewelry, making the ornaments for the decoration of the deities. In this way, we're absorbing our mind and thinking how to serve Krishna, how to give pleasure to Krishna using our different abilities, whatever talents we have. You know, somebody is good. In, like Kirtan, you're playing very nice harmonium and singing very nicely. You can do that also for Krishna. Lord Chaitanya has a Sankirtan party in, in the spiritual world. You can join the Sankirtan party with Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And the gopis also do Kirtan. So everyone has a particular taste for some particular activity to serve Krishna in some way. Somebody, maybe you're just cleaning the temple. You can also do that for Krishna. Your meditation is just to clean and to keep the temple nice for Krishna. One of the associates of, uh, well, he was, a, he, was, he was sent to Vrindavan to be a student of Jiva Goswami. His name was Shamananda. And actually, initially, his name was Duki Krishna. But his name got changed to Shamananda. So this, uh, this devotee, anyway, in his meditation, he was boiling the milk because in Goloka, they have a lot of cows and they have the milk and you know the milk has to be boiled and churned you're going to make it into some will be made into yogurt some will be made into butter and ghee and you have to boil the milk so 
when you boil the milk, sometimes it, you know the milk will boil up, just like today we were doing Pongo Festival at the temple this morning, and the, the milk would boil over, right, over the sides of the pot, and so he would use his hands to take the pot off the fire because it was not gas; they were just using gober. You don't, you, you don't use gas in the spiritual world, you know. Go burn. And so, you, they have to take the pot off sometimes to cool it. His hands got burnt. So he was, it was only meditation, but his hands were all burnt. How did his hands get burnt? He was not, nobody saw him ever cooking, but in his own...